Happy Sabbath, church. Okay. All right. So I'll be doing some... Well, actually, welcome, everybody. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad that you're here with us today. I know it's uh, a little rainy outside, but the earth is uh, enjoying it. I know the, the trees and the, the flowers are, are liking it very much. Um, I do have some announcements, and after that, I'm going to have Sean come up for a special announcement. But welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you're here for the first time... I hope you know that this is now your home church, so just get comfortable and dig right in. Um, so the flowers today I hear are from Pastor Gresford and Elia to celebrate their 13th wedding anniversary, so congratulations, Pastor and Elia. I don't know where Elia is at, but she's, oh, okay. <laughs> but congratulations, that's a, that's a big number. And we look forward to many, many more. Um, the Agape Feast, uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Uh, it's going to be something small, not too heavy. 
Yeah, soup, salad, um, yeah, communion, very intimate. Um, so if you would like to come and join, uh, please do so. It's going to be in the fellowship hall. Um, it'll only be for maybe about an hour or so, not too long. Um, church office is closed uh, for the New Year holiday, so if you're trying to drop something off or get in touch with anybody, it will be closed that day. Um, so come the following day, which is Tuesday at 9 a.m. There is a Pathfinder meeting this, uh, this coming Tuesday. We were going to resume again. I know we we're off for the holiday break, um, but I know many of us are eager to get back uh, to hanging out with one another um, and doing Pathfinder stuff. And if you have children that are Pathfinder age that are not in the Pathfinder club, there's still time to join. It's, it's a little late, but it's okay. We'll make an exception. Come and join our, our, our group. We look forward to having you there. But 6.30 p.m. at Tuesday uh, for the Pathfinder meeting. And I think, is there one more? Oh, yes, okay. So uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting, uh, prayer group is held right here in the transept. Uh, Pastor Thomas leads out. Um, they're still reading the steps to personal revival. So if you want to come and join uh, that special group, 7 p.m. on Wednesdays and also every Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, there's a women's devotional meeting in the youth room. You could, you could meet in person or you could meet on Zoom. Um, I'm sure there's more details about that in the bulletin or, okay. So if you have some questions about, you know, joining on Zoom, look, look at the bulletin for some more details. But it's always nice to be in person when we have these meetings. It, it, it makes it more special, but if you can't and you want to meet on Zoom, that's the other option also. Um, the fellowship luncheon will take place next Sabbath in the fellowship hall. So if you like to eat, who in here likes to eat? Everybody likes to eat, right? Well, it's, it's buffet style, so if you like to eat, please bring a dish so you could offer somebody else something to eat. So it, it's nice to have an abundance of food. You know, there's a lot of people that show up, so we just want to make sure that everybody has something to eat. So if you would like, bring your favorite dish, bring a special dish, and enjoy with uh, one another. All right, so we have uh, Sean for one more special announcement. Just a special announcement is to piggyback on the Pathfinders. As you know, we're um, planning on going to Gillette for the International Campery, and we need to buy our tickets. So I've sent out um, an email to everyone that I think I have the email to, but I also want to give verbal notice. If anyone else would like to go that is um, with Pathfinders, has kids, Tuesday, I try to kind of have as a soft deadline. I want to get tickets purchased. So for all Pathfinders, please, if you can, bring your money for the tickets on Tuesday, the Pathfinders. Um, there's less than 15,000 tickets left, and we need to get them purchased so we don't miss out. So all the Pathfinder staff, get the numbers in, be prepared on this coming Tuesday so that we can get all that finalized. And we will get ready to go and start making our plans and preparations. Thank you, brother. And that's it for the announcements. Uh, I don't really usually do the announcements, so Pastor, am I supposed to offer a prayer after this? Oh, the invocation, okay. Ah, uh, hey, sorry. Pastor makes it look so... He, he makes it look so smooth when he's up here and he does all this stuff. He's, he's a real pro. But can we have the praise team come up for a call to worship? Let us all stand. Sabbath day, 
on this final Sabbath day of 2023 to worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Lord, as the showers are falling, a rarity here in this uh, part of the world, we, we ask for your showers of blessing to fall upon this place. Lord, we pray that every individual that is here, that is watching, will receive a special blessing specifically for them as we honor you and we lift up the name of Jesus. We pray a blessing on those who are participating. And Lord, we just want to thank you for sending Jesus to die on our behalf. So guide us, bless us, continue to be with us as we honor you and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Sabbath. Let us begin this final Sabbath of 2023 by singing a song of praise. Hymn number 249. Praise Him. Praise Him. We welcome another, the final Sabbath of the year. We are thankful for this day. Let us sing our next song, hymn number 383, O Day of Rest and Gladness. Oh, 
Let us all stand for our opening song. Hymn number 306, Draw Me Nearer. Hymn number 306.
Please be seated. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to all of you. I'm wanting to draw attention to our offering today. It is, if you look in the bulletin, it's called the Pacific Union Designated Offering, which is kind of a backup plan, I guess, for emergencies and things that aren't planned for. And if we look back on 2023, we know sometimes those things arise. So they're being prepared for those special needs. So I hope that you uh, will be generous in your offering and think of all the blessings you've received this year. And remember, when we return blessings to the Lord, that he blesses us. I wanted to read Malachi 3.10, which is kind of the old standard about offering, but I like it. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the, gates, the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So just remember to be generous with your offering if you can. And also, the loose offering goes to our local church budget. Would the deacons please stand? Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this blessed Sabbath day. And we thank you for the time that we've set aside to worship you and to honor you. We look back on the last year and realize all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We're so grateful for them, and we ask that you continue to guide us in our ministry here in Ontario. We ask that you put a special blessing on those that can give and, of course, on those that cannot. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Now's the time where we can come together, joining one another, and um, bring your petitions to our Heavenly Father. You can come up to the front, and we'll all, I will have a prayer um, for all of us.
table, let's kneel down. <clears throat> Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we are so blessed. We are so happy that we have made it through this week. We are blessed to be able to gather together as brothers and sisters and praise you and worship you and just to learn about you today, this Sabbath day, the day that you've made for us, Lord. Lord, thank you for all the blessings. Thank you for uh, those of us who have um, work. Thank you for the roof of our heads. Thank you for the food that we eat. Thank you infinitely, Lord, for transportation, for our, for our clothes on our backs. Thank you so much for, for all of this. Sometimes we we don't thank you enough, Lord. We are just so infinitely grateful for all that you do in our lives, Lord, uh, all the blessings that you bestow upon us, Lord. And we also want to thank you for the trials because, Lord, through trials, we hold tighter and tighter to your grip, Lord, to your hand, Lord. We look to you, looking for guidance, looking for comfort, Lord. And Lord, I know that this has been a challenging week for some of the families, Lord. We know that some families, uh, their loved ones are in the hospital. We know that some people have gone through surgeries. We know that some people are ill, Lord, whether respiratory or any other illness, Lord. And they're, Or maybe they're battling a chronic disease, Lord. Lord, at this moment, Whoever they are, wherever they may be, we want to lift up them up to your heavenly throne, Lord. For your word says uh, that anyone who is, is burdened and heavy laden to come to you, Lord, and you will give us rest. And Lord, at this moment, we just want to lay all of our, all of our petitions, all of our heart's desires, things that are, are bothering us in our minds, in our hearts, Lord, uh, emotions, or, or things that happen throughout the week, Lord, we just want to lay it at your feet. Lord, we want to know that we, we, you will take care of it, Lord, in due time, Lord. Lord, we ask that if anyone here, Lord, is in need of any emotional comfort or any mental comfort, Lord, or physical comfort, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you may give them a great embrace, Lord. May you heal their infirmities. May you heal, heal their hearts, their minds, Lord, if it is your will, Lord. Thank you so much for all that you do for us, Lord. And most importantly, thank you for keeping us um, till today throughout this entire year that has been with its own challenges. But Lord, we are here. We are longing to draw closer and closer to you, Lord. And we just ask that this upcoming year, may that be our heart's desires. May we spend more time in your word. May we spend more time talking to you. May we spend more time shining for you, Lord, so that you can come so quickly. Lord Jesus, come so quickly. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You hear the music, so you know what time it is. But during the announcements, because it's not something I normally do, I got a little nervous. There is a special announcement. And it's really awesome because it's free to everybody. There are books in the foyer when you leave today. So if you would like to take a book or two, they're free. They're out there, all displayed nice and neatly. So if you would like to take one, please do so. But now it's time for a children's story. So children, you know what to do. And for our visitors who are here, um, you'll see some kids go up and down the aisles with some smiling, pretty faces. And what they're going to do is collect a special offering. And what that offering goes to... Uh, help is to offset some of the costs of Christian education. So if you want to give a little donation, uh, please do so. And then kids come down to the front and enjoy the children's story.
All right. I like this little group right here. They were walking real slow, making sure to make eye contact with every adult as they walked by. <laughs> Good job, ladies. Good job. <laughs> so happy Sabbath. Can you believe it's the last Sabbath of the year, 2023? Unbelievable. It went by so fast, and we're at the end. So I'm glad that you guys are here today. And I have a special story. Um, and I, I labeled this one. I don't think I put it on the, on the slide, but I labeled this one Powerful Prayer. Now, hey, welcome, Kenny. Thank you for joining. Okay, so have any of you ever been in pain? Show of hands, yeah? Like what kind of pain? Like your knee hurts, your finger hurts. What kind of pain? Anybody want to share? Oh, you cut yourself. Oh, yeah, that, that hurts. Anybody else? You didn't cut yourself? No? Do you feel no pain? Because you're Kenny. Yeah, super strong. Anybody else? Anytime, anytime you felt pain. Okay, go ahead. One more. You were dirt biking with no pants. Wow, that's, that's brave. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. You burned your leg on the, on the muffler. Oh, yes. That's very, very painful. I remember one time I was playing street hockey with some friends, and I was rollerblading back to the house because the game had just ended. And I was getting thirsty. I was like, you know, I'm just going to go home. So I had my stick just dragging on the floor. But as I was coming up to the driveway, I didn't lift the stick up. So it caught just a little bit of the curb. And guess what happened? I'm going forward. The stick stopped. Ugh. Ugh. Do you think that felt good? No. Oh, not at all. Okay. But that's not my story. This is a different one. So this involves some stomach pain. Oh, has anybody ever experienced some stomach pain? Stomach ache, yes. Is it a good feeling? It's not a good feeling. Yeah, your tummy does hurt. It, it, it's painful. It could cripple you. Like this lady right here just leaned over like, oh, it hurts so bad. And this actually involved one of my children. And you guys might know. So this happened at our Christmas party at church. And I was like, what? Like, what's going on? And we had to leave right away because one of my kids was in a lot of pain. And I was shocked because this is my tough kid. So I was like, okay, if this one's in pain, then it must be serious. Okay, so um, we had a decision to make. Okay, what do we do? Do we take her to the hospital? Do we call 911? What, what's going on? So we decided to take her to the hospital. And let me, ha let me tell you what was happening as I was picking her up and taking her to the vehicle, okay? She was in pain. She was crying, which is normal. It's fine. You know, if you're in pain, it's okay to cry. But she said something to me, and I was like, I, I won't share the, the details, but she said something to me, and it made me think, and I was like, you know what? No. It's, everything's going to be okay because I know who I, I serve. So I started praying, and I was like, Lord, Whatever it is, take the pain away before we get to the hospital. So I'm praying the whole time she's in the back. We're driving to the hospital. We get checked in. I do all my other stuff that I have to do. We get back, okay? By the time I get back, the, this is what the scene looks like, right? Laying in the hospital. So the whole time we're sitting there, we're waiting for the doctor. What do you think I'm doing still? Still praying. Like, Lord, let everything be okay. Let nothing be seriously wrong. Let this be something simple. But who, who else do you think was in the room? Could be the angels, yes. But I like to believe that maybe God was there. How did you get there? Right? Isn't it comforting to know that when you're in a time of need that God is there? Amen? Amen? So, long story short, with everything that happened, no fancy medicine was needed, no operation was needed, no, I don't know, no device, no nothing was needed because God took care of everything. And 
when I saw this verse, actually before I get to the verse, okay, as I'm praying for my kid, do you think there's other people in the hospital that are sick? Yes, there's a lot of people. Surprisingly, there's a lot of people, a lot of kids there or that, that night also, okay? So what do you think I got a chance to do? Unbeknownst to them, I got to pray for them also while I was sitting in the waiting room. We got to listen to another young person having some issues. We got to listen to a young mom with her baby having some issues. When we went to the x-ray room, there was an older lady who had a broken, broken shoulder. I don't know how she broke her shoulder, but she was in a lot of pain. I got to pray for her, and she didn't even know. And I like to think that God took care of everybody's need that night, not because of me, because I have any special power, because I asked him to help those people also. So a long story short with this one, in this verse that I, that I liked, and I just happened to read that day. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even unto his ears. So you think, do you think it was a good night after all the praying and everything? Yes, we went home. No problem. It was, just, it was just an exciting time, I like to think. But God took care of that special need of my child. So what I want to stress to young people is whatever kind of pain you're in, whatever situation you might find yourself in, what should be the first thing you do? You need to pray because there's so much power in prayer. And for the adults that are in this church, get involved. Be part of a group. You know, with the, the elders, the regular members, it is so powerful to watch. We have a little prayer group on text when somebody's in need of something. The requests that come through and the answered prayers, it's amazing. So don't miss out on the blessing. Prayer is powerful. When many people pray for you, it's even more powerful. So take that lesson for young kids. Take that lesson. Don't, you're not too young to pray. You're not, it doesn't matter if it's a couple words, of, just even one word. Help. God will hear you. So let's end with, this, with, with a, a nice prayer to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that uh, this event that happened to us um, turned out to be okay, dear God. And also, um, you know, the, the things that happened behind the scenes, I'm so thankful for the church members that were there asking if I needed anything to watch over the kids that I had to leave behind because we went to the hospital. It's just comforting to be part of a church family, dear God, where, you know, you don't have to worry because we are like family. We'll take care of one another. But we thank you so much just for answering the prayers, um, answering the prayers of this, the group text, dear God, because there's a lot that goes on in there. We're almost done with the prayer. <laughs> but Lord, be with these young people. Help them to understand that you care for them and that no matter what they're going through, dear God, you're in the room with them always. So help them not to forget that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, 33, 34. But seek his, no, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own.
Well, good morning, church family. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Good to worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm always happy to be able to open up, study the word of God with you today. Thank you, Isaiah, for reading that text. I really appreciate the fact that this morning you came and you found me to let me know you were going to be reading and uh, you wanted to just make sure everything was okay. And thanks for volunteering in the future to read texts again. I, I really appreciate that. And I like that tie. Very nice tie. Good touch. Today's message, again, the title is Don't Worry, Be Seeking. And, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone would disagree with me if I, if I said that we live in a world where there is no shortage of things to worry about. It's always something to be concerned about, it seems, from, from personal things such as uh, job security or, or, or health. Uh, to larger issues such as um, uh, political conflicts that we see happening or, or natural disasters. You know, but, but the thing is that many people live in a, in a state of constant apprehension about things that are happening outside of their control. Even as Christians, we often fix our mind and attention on, on what might happen instead of focusing on our current situation and what God is doing. We fail to take hold of the counsel that is found in the Word of God that talks about how we should battle worrying. Again, the title of my message is Don't Worry, Be Seeking. Before we go any further, though, let's have a word of prayer and ask for, the God, ask for God to lead and guide us. Father, I pray that you would open my lips. So my mouth may declare your glory. May the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. May everything here that is said and done be done for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Don't worry. Be seeking. I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles if you have them. We're going to be looking specifically at this text today, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. There will be other texts that we'll be looking at to supplement it. But the main message is going to be here from Colossians chapter 3, 1 and 4. This message of the Colossians is written to a, a church in the city of Colossae. That's the name of the, the city. And um, what it, this message is about that was written to this church, if we could sum it up, it's that you cannot put your life into compartments. Sometimes we try to separate our, our, our church life from our, our work life from our, our, our home life. But, but what, this is, what this book is talking about is, is we shouldn't compartmentalize our life. Once you have made a decision for Jesus, no part of your human existence must be untouched by the rule of Christ. In other words, living for Jesus is a holistic experience. Now, the message found in Colossians is, is for us today. Every part of our lives must be affected and captivated by the rule of Christ. And this is what brings us to Colossians chapter 3, where Paul proclaims how this is practically done. Let's read it. I'm reading from the New King James. They're on the screen. For those of you who have your Bibles, I invite you to look there as well. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. I want to look at this text by looking at the steps that are given here as far as how we live this life that's not compartmentalized. But I'm going to do something that my homiletics professor would, would uh, mark me for. I'm going to divert a little bit. because, And the reason I'm doing that is because I, I want for you to understand the way that, that I personally um, analyze a text when I'm trying to interpret it or expand upon it. Okay, so the first thing I look at is I, I look at the verbs, the action words. I, I ask, what is God asking me to do? Or, or what is God doing through the person that is being spoken about or spoken to in this particular text? I do that with the understanding that, that the Bible is not written just for the purpose of giving me a roadmap of how to get to heaven, but the Bible is written to tell me how to optimize my life 
and live in the here and now. The Bible's not just a ticket into heaven. Instead, it's an avenue by which we learn how to navigate life in the here and now. It's important that we understand that. We're going to get into that as far as what this text means. One text that that I love that that explains this so explicitly is Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord, or the Bible, we can say the Bible, is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, again, the Bible, is, uh, is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Do you understand what you're reading here? This is telling us what the the power of God's word is. It has the power to, to change us into productive, emotionally intelligent, insightful, well adjusted people that we all desire to be. The problem comes. When we use the Bible as a rule book or a self-help guide to tell us how to get to heaven or, or how to solve a particular problem that we may be having. The Bible is more than this. I want for us to understand this. The, the, the Bible is more than this. It is a narrative. It is a story that shows us how God relates to humanity and all of his creation in different seasons of time and space. It's a story that shows us that we serve a God who loves us beyond our imagination and will move heaven and earth to see to our personal salvation. And one of the things that he's looking to do is to eliminate an infection that we have in this universe called sin. We see this idea of what, we talk, or what I'm talking about in, 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 a, in a narrative found in Exodus 20. What's found in Exodus 20? Anyone tell me? The Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 has the Ten Commandments. This is where God gives the Ten Commandments. But there's only one problem if we look at Exodus chapter 20. We call them the Ten Commandments, but God never did. Exodus chapter 20. Verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these commandments. Does it say that? God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He spoke words. In fact, scholar, any scholar you speak to will not call this the Ten Commandments. They call it the Ten Words. What does that mean exactly? Why is that so important? Words, commandments, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. What difference does it make? Well, that word, the word for words in in Hebrew is is, is Deborim. And and here's what it means. Here's what it means. It, It does mean words, but it also means something promised or a promise. So Exodus 20, according to the Bible, does does not give us the Ten Commandments, but it gives us the Ten Words, or more accurately, the Ten Promises of God. And when we think of it like that, what it does is it, 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 it changes the way we look at the words found in Exodus chapter 20. Traditionally, the first commandment is, is what? First commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But, but what we see here is, is that in Judaism, I learned, and I didn't understand it at first, but in Judaism, the first commandment for them is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And I'll say, that, that's not a command. It's not a command, but it is a word. It's a promise. It's the foundation of a promise. 
And we know in Romans chapter 3, verse 2, that, that Paul says that from the Jews, we, 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 we get the oracles of God. We, we learn the secret things of God. Yes, we know that they turn their back on Christ, but there are certain things that we need to read carefully as we, from their perspective to understand it in, 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 a, in a clearer light. If we read the text, what we see here is a proclamation from God. From their perspective, this is the first Word. This is the first commandment. It is the foundation of a larger promise. I am the Lord, your God. I belong to you, and you belong to me. I brought you out of slavery. I brought you out of bondage. And now I want you to listen to the promises and the plans that I have for you. Then he goes on to list these, these other words which again, we, we call commandments. But, but what they are, there are words that, that illustrate how we are to live our lives if we are children of the promise. If we've accepted the fact that, that, that God has called us out of bondage, God has called us out of, uh, of a life uh, living uh, by our own means, we can rest on these promises. I am your God, and I brought you out of slavery, and, and, and I want to make you part of my divine narrative. I want to make you part of, of this story that I'm sharing across the universe. If you want to stay out of slavery, if you don't want to be in bondage ever again, if you want to continue in my story, you will not put any other gods before me. If you want to stay out of bondage and, and if you want to be part of, of the narrative that, that I'm writing, you will not take my name lightly. You will not take it in vain. You will remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You will not kill. You will not steal. You will not commit adultery. And, and we know the list. I'm sure we memorized them somewhere along the way. So the commandments or the words were never meant to be something you do or that you face as far as punishment. These words are, 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 are more cause and effect than they are punishment and reward. If I climb to the top of the church and, and I jump off, expecting to go up, I'm going to be in a sad state. These words are all part of the, the promise that God established at the beginning of their journey into Canaan. I brought you out. And now I want you to live for my glory. To live in a, in a way that will honor me. Because this is the best way to live. Continue to follow those words. And, and, and the result will be my continuance as your God. As the one who brought you out, I will continue to, to bring you out of bondage. I will continue to, to draw you out of these situations. Living under these words brings the promise of an abundant and purposeful life. That's a promise. But by the same token, to reject these words, which, which is, which is our, the choice that they had, and the choice that we have is to follow a different story. You're saying, you know, God, I don't, I don't want to be part of your story. I, 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 don't, I don't like the way it, 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 it ends. I don't like the way it goes. I, I remember when I was a kid, we had these books. Maybe they still have them these days where you, where you, you, you read the, the, the story and it gets to a point that says, if you, want to, if you want Sally to go left, turn to page 52. If you want her to go right, turn to page 45. And, and you could create your own narrative. You could create your own story by, by picking, by Choices that you make within the, the entirety of the book. Life is the same way. We have a choice which narrative that we're going to follow. We have a choice which direction that we're going to go. There is a story that God has written, a narrative that he has written, and, and, and these Ten Commandments are, are basically showing this, this is how you stay within the narrative. This is how you stay within the story. But the enemy, he's written a story as well. But his story is, I want to steal, I want to kill, and I want to destroy. And, he, and he's not even lying about it. It's there in Scripture. 
Revelation 12 tells us that he's coming with all his fury, even if that's at this time, knowing that his time is short. He knows what the end of his story will be, and he wants as many of us as possible to be part of his story. God's story only wants to give life to the fullest. In the here and the now and throughout all eternity. God's story cannot tolerate the proliferation of sin because, in a word, sin kills. Sin is not part of the original narrative of the universe. It is a lethal infection in the universe. It it kills emotionally. It it kills spiritually, psychologically, and and, and physically. And, And since God is about the business of life and love for humanity, he must judge sin and remove it from the narrative. This is the message of the Bible. When we read the Bible, this is, this is what we're, we're reading. We're not, we're not reading a, a rule book, but we're, we're, we're deciding whether or not we want to become part of a story, whether we want to journey with God. And this is also how we're called to engage in Scripture. It's a call to stand on his promises, the promises that he established there at Sinai, that he established at the beginning, that he continues to establish with us on a daily basis, to stand on those promises. This brings us back to Colossians. Go back to Colossians. In this scripture, what we see is is practical steps for us to follow as as we endeavor to live under the great promises given to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It starts off by saying, if you were then raised with Christ. In other words, have you chosen to be a child of promise? Have you accepted the salvation of God? It is the same message that he gave these former slaves at Sinai when he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. If you're raised with me, I raise you up out of Egypt. I want you to be raised with me as you enter into Canaan. So when we acknowledge that that Christ is our, our Savior and we have new life through him, there's something that we do. If you then were raised with Christ, what's the next word? Seek. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. The word seek is a powerful word. It means to investigate. It means to seek information about It means to strive for something. And it also means to desire something. But it could also mean to demand something. The title of today's message is, Don't Worry, Keep Seeking. By nature... Being a human being, we're all seeking after something. We all are. We all have desires. We all have a level of curiosity that that causes us to strive for something. Some among us are that are still in school are seeking to, to get the best grades possible. Some are some maybe are, that are finished with school are, are looking for that, that perfect job, or, or if we're at the tail end, getting to the tail end of our, of our uh, career, we're, we're looking at that to, to save enough funds in order to have enough for retirement. And still others are seeking to find that, that proper balance between family time and, and home time and, and church time. We are all seekers. But the Bible is clear that as individuals who have latched on to God's agenda of living under his promises, we must seek things that are above where Christ is now enthroned and seated at the right hand of God. This brings us to our scripture reading today. Again, thank you, Isaiah, for reading that. Found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its trouble. Seek first the kingdom. When we look at that, the first thing we need to ask, the first thing I asked anyway, was what is meant by the kingdom? What is seek first the kingdom? What am I seeking after? You know, for, for the Jews, as they, as they might have heard this, they, the, the, the kingdom was the rule of, of Messiah here on earth, that the Romans would be toppled over and, and the physical kingdom would be established where Israel would take its rightful place as the premier power on planet earth, just like it was back in the days of, of David and Solomon. And when I say this also in, in the Christian context, and we think about the kingdom of God, Many see it as this celestial city up above, the new Jerusalem. That's the kingdom. And we'll be there for a thousand years. And, and after that thousand years, we'll, it'll come down and rest on planet Earth and we'll be here for eternity. But what does the Bible say about the kingdom? Not me. What does the Bible say? Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating or, and drinking, but, what's the word? And, and in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, this is one of those verses, and I can say because I was reading through it. It's one of those verses that, that you could almost kind of read in passing as you're trying to get the entirety of what Romans chapter 14 is saying. It's almost like one of those uh, quickly, you just read by it quickly and, and you miss what's being said. But, but what I see here is that the kingdom of God is not about a physical location. It's not about a, a place. It's not about the, the activities that take place in this location. The kingdom of God is about a spiritual and internal alignment to following Jesus Christ. It refers to aligning our hearts to righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit, just as it says. To be righteous... It's not merely just a moral construct. It means to be in a right relationship. We think of King David, a righteous man, and yet we see what he did to Uriah and, and Bathsheba. But, but yet even after that, he was still called, after he repented, he was called the righteous man because he was in a right relationship with God. He knew that when he sinned, he said, Lord, create me a clean heart, renew a right spirit. Take not your presence away from me. He understood that he, he needed to do his part to get back into that relationship with God. So even as a man who, who sinned horribly, he was still a righteous man because he was always seeking to be in a right relationship with God. On Mount Sinai, when God made the promises to the slaves he freed, his desire was to be in a right relationship with them. They had just come out of bondage. They were worshiping all of these Egyptian idols. And even though God, one by one, had shown that, that those idols were, were nothing by the way that he uh, put the plagues uh, in place, they still needed to learn how to live in a right relationship with their redeemer. Seeking the kingdom first means putting a relationship with God first and foremost, a right relationship with God. Not a sinless relationship, a right relationship with God. You're always seeking to be in that place where, where you're drawing closer and closer. Now, it doesn't mean you take advantage and you just sin at will. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that when you do falter, you come back and say, Lord, I repent. I don't want to go in that path again. That's what is meant by a right relationship. It means allowing the promises of God to be your compass in every decision that you make. And if you do that, everything else will come into play. 
all these things will be added to you. That's a promise. So the kingdom is about righteousness. It's about peace as well. There's a reason that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He's the son of man. He's the son of God. As, as the ruler of God's kingdom, he imparts peace that is different than anything this world knows. In John chapter 14, verse 27, as he's sitting with that, in that final meal with his disciples, he says something to them, uh, again, that probably went over their head at the time, but it's something very powerful that, that they, they understood later as they were uh, uh, pushing their ministry forward and doing the things that God had called them to do in the book of Acts. At John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And that's nice. But then he says, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Don't worry. Keep seeking. The word for peace the word that's talked about here is a set of favorable circumstances. As we navigate the world, what it means is, is that even in the midst of troubling times, which Jesus says we will face, you will have troubling times, he says, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. He says even in those troubling times, because I am the Prince of Peace, because I'm giving you a peace that this world cannot give, you can have the assurance that my promises will be sure and will remain intact. In this world, many are seeking peace. But the problem is that, that any peace that this world gives is not true peace. Jesus himself said he gives a peace that the world is, is unable to give. Peace in this world has us looking over our shoulders. Okay, things are calm now, but when is the next blow-up going to be? But the peace of Jesus is something we can look to, something we can depend on always. It's a peace that will dispel worry. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be worried. Neither let it be afraid. Because I'm giving you a peace that the world cannot give. You're going to be thrown into prison, but I'm giving you a peace that the world cannot give. Your life is going to be threatened, but I'm giving you a peace that the world cannot give. People are going to laugh at you when, when, when you present uh, the message of, of my love for humanity, but I'm giving you a peace that this world is unable to give you. Friends, as we seek the kingdom, we will find peace. Peace in the promises of the one who is the prince of peace. Peace with one another through the one who is the prince of peace. And the promise of eternal peace when he establishes his physical kingdom to come. The final defining characteristic that is given in Romans chapter 14, 17, is that joy in the Holy Spirit. Many seek in this life for, for happiness. I want to be happy. I want to, if I have just a little bit more money, I know I can, I can be happy. But God says he wants us to have joy. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy can be described as, as spiritual contentment. And that can only come by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's why he doesn't just say joy. He says joy in the Holy Spirit. Only with Christ living in you, the hope of glory, can you experience the joy that only God can give us. It says it doesn't matter what comes my way. Because God's Spirit is in me. And I have the promise of eternity with Jesus through him. So, friends, we're called to seek first the kingdom. We're called to be seeking. But Jesus also addresses something in Matthew 6 that we all deal with. The elephant in the room. Oh, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Could have ended right there. But then he says, therefore, 
Do not worry about tomorrow. Worry is a real thing. But it can be dispelled if we fill our time with seeking God's kingdom. If we fill our time pursuing and investigating what it means to be part of the family of God, to be part of his kingdom, to be part of his narrative, to be part of the journey he wants us to join in. Concerning worry, you know, planning for tomorrow is time well spent. But worrying about tomorrow is time wasted. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between planning and worrying. Careful planning is is thinking ahead about goals and and, and steps and and schedules and and, and trusting God for guidance in that process. That's what it means to be a mission-driven church and, and following God's vision and mission for us. When done well, planning can help alleviate worry. Because as we prayerfully plan, we see God in the midst of it. And that peace that only he can give will be within us. Warriors, by contrast, are consumed by one word, fear. Fear. And and when you have fear, it's difficult to trust God. It just is. It's just difficult to put your trust in God if if you have, if that four-letter word is what drives you. They let their plans interfere with the relationship with God. But friends, I say to you today, don't let the worries about tomorrow affect your relationship with God today. Seek first his kingdom today. And the righteousness and and, and doing things the right way and, and, and that relationship with him. And everything else will be added to you. I want to conclude today by giving just a practical tool or two that we could use to be seeking God because it's such an important thing. And the the inspiration behind this message is is beginning of this week as I was thinking about the message, I thought of the the magi, the wise men, and, and the saying how it says wise men still seek him. There they were in a far land, not knowing anything, but yet seeing that star and, and, and knowing in their writings that there was something about that star. The Bible says that we saw his star. We, we saw it and we knew that we had to follow it. They had that determination to follow after God. They planned, really they planned their trip and they, they made their way toward to Jesus. And yet in that land, some two or three miles away, They were scholars and individuals who knew the scripture. And yet, there was the king of the universe next door. And they didn't even know him. What are we seeking after today, friends? One of the tools that we can use to be seeking God is a healthy prayer life. Thank you, Chris, for your children's story about prayer because it's such an important, important factor. And I'm not just talking about personal prayer, but I'm also talking about corporate prayer. Prayer is communication with God. The speaking of of God as as with a friend, I believe is how Ellen White describes it. But it's also a source of encouragement. There's a difference between I'll pray for you and I'll pray with you. Amen? Prayer lifts the soul. Prayer solidifies the bonds we have as a a faith community. Prayer tells worry, get lost and find someone else to bother. Friends, as we enter into a new year, as we finish off this year, it is my hope and prayer that we will be seekers, seekers of God, seekers of his kingdom, that we will allow his his righteousness to, to fill us, that we will be drawn 
to Christ Jesus. One of the things that we're going to be doing during our prayer meeting, I like that we're going to be doing 10 days of prayer. I have some flyers made up. It's called Priorities of, of Faith. We go from January 10 to 20. We're going to meet for 10 days. And we're going to be praying as a church. We're going to be learning different ways to engage in prayer as a, as a community. This is something that the, the world church has put together. I didn't put it together. The world church has put it together. And there are different topics that will be there. And it's my hope and prayer that, that on one of the days, ten, I may not be able to make 10 straight days, but at least on one or two of the days, you'll be able to come out and be, be part of this journey. The flowers will be out next Sabbath for you to, to look at. I have to check in with our prayer ministries coordinator here first before I put them out there. But uh, we'll be... We'll be going forward and, and doing that and, and understanding that one of the most important ways that we, could be, that we should be seeking God as we go into 2024 is to enhance and solidify our prayer lives, not just individually, as I said, but also corporately. A church that prays together, stays together, defeats the enemy together, hastens the coming of Jesus together. And, and, and engages the community together, and the community will see something that, that we don't even see. A praying church is a church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. And it's my hope and prayer that that is what we become more and more of. A church that prays together and draws closer to Jesus. A church that prays together and heeds his call. May it be our hope, may it be our desire today to be that church and heed his call. Call that is made softly and tenderly, which is our closing hymn. I'm going to ask our prayer, praise team to come up and lead us in our closing hymn. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. So let us all stand.
Let us pray, Father, as we have sung this song in response to what we have heard about seeking, Lord, and not worrying. Lord, I pray that each individual in this place will heed that soft and and tender petition that you have for us to come home to accept your promises, to rest on your promises, to know that that everything will be added to us if we seek first your kingdom, seek your rule in our, our lives, to seek the peace that Jesus can give, to seek the righteousness that he gives, and to seek the joy that is there in your spirit. So Lord, in this final Sabbath of 2023, We've come this far by faith, and we thank you so much for bringing us through another year. And we ask for your presence to guide us and go with us as we go into a a, a new year. May your spirit lead everything that is done in this church. I pray that you would bind us together with cords that cannot be broken, that you would open our hearts and minds to the leading of your spirit. And now receive this final benediction of the year. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face on you. And may he give you his peace. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, let the people of God say, Amen and Amen. Bless Sabbath to everyone.